Um, we have had an orgy of virtue signalling uh, in another area this week, an orgy of virtue signalling on the issue of te reo Māori, the uh, Māori language. And we have had wall-to-wall coverage. Basically, Shortland Street has been in te reo. Most of our news bulletins from state and legacy media and stuff, all full of stories of the wonderfulness of the Māori language, how the evil colonial oppressors beat people, sent them almost, you'd believe, they sent them to concentration camps for speaking Māori. Um, and then, of course, generally white people saying how wonderful it is to learn Māori. Uh, and, boy, it gets a lot of you going. It doesn't get me going, it bemuses me. Um, and what I want to do this morning is read what I think is one of the best takes on Māori Language Week and the Māori language that I have seen. And it comes to us, and it is on the Platform Opinions website. You must remember the platform is not just the most entertaining 11 hours of live radio and then replays in Aotearoa, New Zealand. It's not the greatest independent journalism you're going to find anywhere. It's not the best music with Leanne. It's not the best sport with Marty. It's not the most obnoxious talkback with Michael Laws. Um, the Platform is an app that has several strings to it. It has replays of our interviews and other content from other providers, and it has a, a, an opinion section, which is where we publish columns. And, you know, columns and opinion, are everyone's doing it, aren't they? Everyone's dropping a column. Uh, one of our best contributors, bar none, and I'd say our best contributor, bar none, is a guy called Graham Adams, who writes out of Auckland. Um, Graham writes from a position of common sense and I think the middle ground of, of New Zealand. His... His columns are universally widely read and I recommend them highly to you. Uh, and currently on the platform uh, app, on the opinions section, there is a column called Are Pākehā Really the Bad Guys in the Demise of Te Reo? And this column is so good. What I wanted to do this morning and before we talk to the Māori Language Commission, I wanted to read it to you. Uh, I recommend that you go back and read it yourself, but I want to read it to you because it is, to my mind, a very sensitive, clear and contextual look at the Māori language in New Zealand. So do bear with me. And, and I've got to say, I have on previous occasions when Graham's written some great stuff, which is often, I've said to Graham, why don't you come on the programme and talk about your column? And Graham's just a guy who doesn't want to do that. Um, so I'm not trying to steal your thunder, Graham. Um, I honour you and your writing by what I'm about to do. So here it is. To mark the beginning of Māori Language Week, veteran journalist Janet Wilson began a listener magazine story, quote, it's the language that refuses to die despite efforts across generations to kill it, close quotes. There was no explanation in the succeeding six pages of what the writer meant by her opening statement, no doubt because in the long-running and simplistic um, morality play staged everywhere in our media, the protagonists and antagonists need no introduction. It is, according to received wisdom, the malign machinations of Pākehā that suppress Te Reo across generations. On Newsroom this week, a senior lecturer in the Auck uh, University of Auckland School of Psychology, Dr Makarena Dudley, referred to some Kaumatua having had their first language, Te Reo Māori, suppressed in early childhood as a result of colonial practices. In The Guardian, Charlotte Graham Maclay wrote that some in the older generations of Māori were beaten at school for speaking the language. The accusation that Māori had their language beaten out of them at school has become common shorthand for the widespread belief that it was Pākehā who were almost entirely to blame for the dwindling fortunes of Te Reo over the past 180 years or more. For that reason, many people are shocked or disbelieving when they are told that prominent Māori were among those pushing most energetically for English to be the only medium of instruction in native schools. Those schools were set up in 1867 as a nationwide system of secular primary schools for Māori children, for which Hapu provided the land, while the government provided the buildings and the teachers. It is an equally inconvenient fact 
that it was Pākehā mis missionaries who from the early 19th century were determined to teach Māori children in te reo, often against the wishes of Māori themselves, who saw proficiency in English as the key to success in trade and politics and as a gateway to the outside world. In 1871, the newly elected MP for Eastern Māori, Karatiana Takamoana, pointed out in Parliament that missionaries had been teaching children for many years and the children are not educated. They have only taught them in the Māori language. The whole of the Māoris in this island request that the government should give instructions that the Māoris should be taught in English only. Takamoana was not a lone voice. A petition by uh, Witi Hakiro in, and 336 others presented to the House of Representatives in 1876 recommended there should not be a word of Māori allowed to be spoken in the school and the master, his wife and children should be persons altogether ignorant of the Māori language so they would not default to Māori in the school. He requested that neither Māori nor Pākehā children should be allowed to speak to Rao in the school playground. There were many more petitions, including one in 1877 by Renata Kawipo and 790 others, and uh, Riripi Rapata and 200 others, requesting that, quote, the government should use every endeavour to have schools established throughout the colony so that the Māori children may learn the English language for by this they will be on the same footing as the Europeans and will become acquainted with the means by which the Europeans have become great. Close quotes. And then we go to the granddaddy of them all, I guess. Sir Aparana Nata, who served as Minister of Native Affairs, was ranked third in Cabinet and whose image graces our $50 note. He mounted a campaign in the 1920s and 30s to have English given priority in Māori primary schools. He argued that proficiency in English, the English language was the key with which to open the door to the sciences and mechanised world and many other callings. Furthermore, it was an approach enthusiastically endorsed by Māori parents in 1930. Nata stated that the primary purpose of the native schools was to teach English. Māori parents do not like their children being taught in Māori, even in the Māori schools, as they argue that the children are sent there to learn English and the ways of the English. This approach only makes sense, of course, when it's understood that Te Reo was widely spoken in homes in Marae where Nata and other leaders believed it would continue to prosper. In short, Māori at home, English at school. By the late 1930s, Nata was becoming worried about language loss. He began to advocate for Māori pupils to be taught both English and Māori on the grounds that nothing was worse than for one to be with Māori features but without his own language. The nation's education bureaucracy, of course, had already catered for Māori being taught to older pupils, which is yet another inconvenient fact for those who believe colonial New Zealanders were determined to strangle Te Reo to within an inch of its life. Te Reo was introduced as a subject for matriculation in 1918 and university entrance in 1929 which were examination students sat in the third or fourth year of high school. Māori language was first introduced as a Bachelor of Arts subject in 1929. In 1944, the influential Thomas Report recommended a core curriculum be established for all secondary schools. It advised that the study of Māori should be encouraged in as many schools as possible. Furthermore, Quote, if Māori is taught, full advantage should be taken of the opportunities that here exist to reveal it as the living language of a living people and to use it as a vehicle for the understanding of the culture it expresses, close quotes. The education regulations were published in 1945, giving effect to the recommendations of the Thomas Report, including the introduction in 1946 of school certificate in which Māori language was included as an examinable subject. None of this is to deny that Māori children may have been caned or strapped for speaking te reo at school, but corporal punishment needs to be put into its historical context. It is probably dif difficult for most people aged under 45 
to understand just how common canings were for trivial offences, from having dirty shoes or untidy lockers or speaking out of turn in class. Being caned or strapped may sound horrific today, but it was simply a fact of life for the majority of school children for much of New Zealand's modern history. Even well into the 1980s, it was unremarkable, which is not to say, of course, it wasn't resented by Māori and Pākehā alike, often for decades later. Television journalist Mike McRoberts rehearsed this narrative in the New Zealand Herald last weekend, saying his father was from a generation when learning to row was discouraged and his grandparents were punished and beaten at school for speaking their own language. His statement would have been more accurate if he had added, discouraging the use of Tereo was a policy that was supported by many of my Māori forebears and promoted by Māori leaders. Why languages didn't dwindle and die out, as many do each year, is a complicated matter. It can't be reduced to a simple mantra of school policy and corporal punishment. What was undoubtedly more influential was the shift of young Māori to the cities in search of work after the Second World War, which divorced them from their rural marae and kaianga where te reo was spoken. Another more recent factor has been the increasing dominance of English in a globalised world. It's spread turbocharged by the internet. Languages function as a repository of culture, but they are primarily a tool for communication and minority languages always struggle in the face of dominant languages, especially when they have as few speakers as Māori does. One of the most telling facts recorded in Janet Wilson's listener article was the tiny proportion of Māori who speak te reo regularly. Te Manahu Morrison, an associate professor at uh, Massey University of te reo, better known as Scotty Morrison, who's the presenter of TVNZ's Te Karere, he assessed uh, that figure as between 2.6 and 2.7%. He emphasises that the key to a successful language revitalisation program is getting it to be spoken in the home, and particularly in Māori homes. As he told the listener, that's the key to language revitalisation. Families speaking the rayo on an everyday basis in their homes. Ironically, well-meaning Pākehā may be getting in the way of that goal as they flood language courses and commandeer the attention of the nation's small pool of te reo teachers who would be better deployed teaching Māori. The results of studies published last year in the Journal of the Royal Society Interface and Modelling showed that if proficient teachers who are predominantly Māori are spread across the whole population, that is detrimental to the language trajectory in the population as a whole because the limited of pool of teachers is spread too thinly. Our results suggest that resources should be focused on supporting Fano and Iwi to realise Te Reo as an everyday language. In other words, teaching non-Māori who aren't going to use the language every day and pass it on to their children may actually hamper the Te Reo revitalisation programme, at least in its early stages. Teddy Horovitz, analysing the Royal Society study for the International Affairs Review from Washington, D.C., described the impediment as unintentional interference from the country's white mine, uh, majority. He recommended prioritising teaching te reo in early childhood education for the Māori group in order to avoid overpowering the voices of the, the group they intended to assist. This question must be asked. Have Pākehā, despite their good intentions, suddenly become the bad guys in the push to revitalise Te Reo right now. It is difficult to interpret the Royal Society's study in any other way. That entire piece from Graham Adam is available on uh, the Platform Opinion site, and I just think it's brilliant, because it says the myth of a colonial extinction drive against Te Reo is just that, it is a myth. Māori, and it doesn't matter now, but let's be clear about the facts, it was Māori who were as much into crushing the Māori language in a formal or educational setting as anyone else. And that right now, your sickly white liberals and your virtue signalers are actually damaging a renaissance in Māori 
by learning a language which they are not culturally connected to and therefore denying Māori and particularly Māori children the opportunity to properly learn and be taught a language with which they are culturally connected. I'm going to raise these issues because uh, after the news at 7.30, we're going to be talking to Christine Amundsen, who is Partnerships and Promotions uh, PR person at the Māori Language Commission, and they've been good enough to front for us this morning. So I know that was a long read, probably the longest thing I've ever read out uh, on the radio, but it is such a good article. And go back and if you've got time, read it now before we do the next interview. So here it is. I'll, I'll summarise it for you. Nicely written too. Easy to read. Thank you, Graham. Basically, the Māori language, it was Māori who wanted their kids to go to school and learn English so they could be like the white fellas. Um, Māori for a long time pushed for their kids to be taught only English at school. Everyone got beaten for all sorts of things at school in the old days. And I know to you so snowflake millennials, etc., out there, it's like the end of the world, regularly beaten. We used to go around feeling quite bad for ourselves a lot of the time. It didn't do us any harm. So the idea that there were, and this is certainly the idea created by all the screaming headlines, is that basically this, the entire nation was, or white nation was um, concentrating on crushing the Maori language. Nothing could be further from the truth. And as you can see, it has been part of our education system and actually formalised as part of our education system for quite some time. So I'm interested in the Māori Language Commission's response to those ideas. I'm also interested in your response to that.